Testament passage is found in the book of Job. And beginning on chapter 38, found on page 484 in your Pew Bible. Listen now for God's word. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Were you there when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens? When the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together, can you hunt the pry of the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God and wonder about for lack of food? Through these words, may we hear the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Again. And let us pray. Gracious God, we pray for your insight and your wisdom. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you as we listen and as we wait for your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Where were you, says God, when I laid the foundation of the earth? A couple of weeks ago, Bob shared with us the beginning story of Job and what happened to him. Just a summary, Job was a faithful, obedient follower of God, and he became the unfortunate guinea pig in a dispute between God and Satan. God challenged, was challenged by Satan to test God, convinced that Job would crack under enough pressure. So God accepted the challenge, and long story short, Job's life fell apart. Actually, Job's life was torturously and methodically ripped apart. He lost his job, he lost his property, he lost his status in the community, his family and friends turned on him, and to add insult to injury, his body was covered in boils. His wife ends by saying, why don't you just go ahead and die already? I'm guessing marriage counseling is in order for them. <laughs> but through it all, Job remains faithful. You see, Job operated up to now trusting in a certain law of nature, a law that many of us wish were absolutely dependable, at least we think we would like it to be that way. And the law goes like this, do good and God blesses you and your life is a blessing. Do bad and you are cursed. Job did good and his life was full of riches, status, his family and his community were well connected, and he was respected in his community, proving at a time in his life that that law was right. Do good and you are blessed, do harm 
and God will get you. But Job is about to learn that life is just not that simple. And we know it too. We know too many life examples where good people suffer and where selfish, greedy, ruthless people seem to prevail. We know too many stories of human suffering where innocence is lost by acts of war, famine, disease, natural disasters, and on and on. Where people just living their lives become the victims of calamity. Take a few or a couple weeks ago in Turkey, where young people are holding a peace demonstration and they're attacked, and about a hundred people are dead, and many more are wounded. Or a couple in one of the churches that I served. Two beautiful children, they go to church regularly, they practice their faith during the week, they share what they have, they welcome the stranger. They were respected by their friends and their family. Their beautiful daughter won a full presidential scholarship to college, ran track, and was a beauty pageant contender. And on December 23rd, just two days from Christmas, she was tragically killed in a car accident. A senseless accident. And in the unfolding hours and days that passed, her parents, along with many of us in the community, asked the inevitable question. God, where were you when Mary was driving down that road? Where were you when she was being airlifted and hooked up to life support? Where were you and why didn't you save her? She never hurt anyone. It doesn't make any sense. Where is God, the Syrians must be asking. Where is God, the pan cancer patient cries. Where is God, the overwhelmed student pleads. Where is God, the people shout. When life is wild and unpredictable, tragic and chaotic. Well now, Job finally has a chance to talk to God. And he must be so relieved, excited, anxious to finally have that conversation. And the chapters before the one that we read are part of that conversation, but it could be summed up like this. First of all, God, what were you thinking? I'm a good man, faithful and obedient to the law. How did you allow my life to fall apart? And what is up with those boils, boils all over my body? Who wants to help a person covered in boils? But now, God, you're going to let me in on the inside track. You're going to tell me what was going on and why this all happened to me. And you're going to say I'm sorry. And then I'm going to understand. You see, Job, like us, was looking for some reasonable explanation as to why God, the God whom he loved and trusted and was faithful to, would allow him to suffer. And this is the beginning of God's response. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what basis was it sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? On and on and on, God goes. 
God does not seem to be showing sympathy for Job. In fact, God comes off rather harsh and uncaring, a part of God we don't like to hear about. If God were in my pastoral care counseling class in seminary, I don't think he'd get a good grade. <laughs> One commentator writes, God does not even acknowledge Job's suffering. In fact, God takes Job on a whirlwind tour of the cosmos, beginning with the foundation of the earth. God instead describes a world that is untamed, wild, and free, a world where humans do not control all things, and in fact have nothing to do with the order of things. A world where part of nature is left to be as it was intended, and where we don't get to control how the animals or the cosmos or the natural cycle of things behave. God describes a world that God dwells in and knows very well, but humans do not. God paints a picture for Job of a world from a much larger perspective. A picture from the beginning of time that honors God's relationship with all of time, all of space, all of creation, of which humans are a very important part, but not the whole shebang. God demonstrates that God cares about all things, everything, from the beginning of time. When my two oldest, who are now 21 and 19, were six and four, an argument ensued in our kitchen. Marshall, who was studying planets in school, asks Riley a question he already knows the answer to, but wanted the joy of showing off. And so he asked, which planet is closer to Earth, Jupiter or Mars? Jupiter, Riley shouts out with all the confidence a four-year-old can muster. Oh, the delight on Marshall's face when she gave that wrong answer. No, ha, you're wrong, Marshall said. It's Mars. And so the argument ensued. Riley was unrelenting in her belief that Jupiter was closer, even though she had absolutely no grounds to base it on. And Marshall, who off, very entertained by the whole argument, was now just fully annoyed. And finally, Riley stands up on the kitchen chair, puts her hands on her hips, looks Marshall straight in the face and says, well, have you ever been to Mars? <laughs> Game over. God says to Job, where were you, Job? when I laid the foundations of the earth. You weren't born, were you? You have no idea. You could read theories in a book. You could study the subject of the planets and know that earth is 4.54 billion years old and that scientists believe all planets are the same age. But that is only what we know in part. The truth is, none of us were there when God laid the foundation of the earth. We were not part of that part of creation. We live in a day and time of information. If you want to know anything about anything, you Google it. And there you have it, the answer a whole list of websites that you can visit to become fully knowledgeable about anything your heart desires. We don't like to not know. Knowledge is power, and power is important, but knowledge also helps us get our head around things, come to terms with some of the difficult things in life that we don't understand. It is a mystery of our faith. It is that transcendent part of God that we are most uncomfortable with. 
the part of God that we cannot fully know in this life. We like the eminent God, God with us, God in Jesus the Christ, who eats with us, laughs with us, teaches us, dies for us. The God who delivers us through Christ with mercy and with love. And all of that is true. But what is also true is that there is more to God than what we can know. There is more to God, and that is a really good thing. One time, someone told my now eight-year-old, Riley, or then eight-year-old, that Riley, she said, you used to be a horse. Riley was so upset with me. She said, Mommy, why didn't you tell me that I used to be a horse? I love horses, and I would have wanted to know that. I was a bit shocked at the whole conversation. She also let me know that the person who told her this knew that reincarnation was the way that things worked because in her previous life, she had died, and when she died, she met Jesus and God, and they told her that this is the way it is. What do you say? My only response that I could think of was, honey, it's just not possible for anybody to know what happens exactly to us after we die. God keeps that a mystery so that we can't hurt each other and take power over each other with the answer. God loves you. Jesus loves you. That's what we need to know. We may struggle with this side of God that we don't know and understand. But thanks be to God that humans don't know all there is to know about God or we would likely have a bigger mess than we already have. Let's let God be God and trust that even in the chaos of life, the suffering and the wrestling with the difficult questions, that God is and was and evermore shall be, loving all of creation, working in the midst of it all, even and especially in life's most difficult and challenging moments to bring about healing and to bring about wholeness for all of creation. When God finished addressing Job, Job's response, which we did not get to hear today because it follows God's proclamation, goes like this. Job declares, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job realized that God cares for him and that God has his life and all of life in mind. And God's ability to restore happened to Job. Because at the very end of the passage, it says, and Job's life was restored. In the midst of the mystery, we are included, even called upon to dwell with God. And we are assured that we are loved with an eternal love. And in the end, isn't that really just enough? Amen.